Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, today we are going to learn all about maximising our potential. Mm. Have you maximised your potential lately? Um, yeah, in some ways, yeah. I guess with things like uh, AI and various other things that I'm re- relearning. I mean, that's that's the best time to learn, isn't it, in your 60s? Because at the end of the day, you know, if you get it wrong, well, who cares? Because you'll be over and done with before long. So, you know, but it's uh, it's it's our pleasure. Now, I'm going to I'm going to butcher her name here, but um. Uh, this is um, our guest today, comes all the way from Australia, and her name is Ren Squario. Oh, well, you right, did a Ren. beautiful job, Graham. That's not butchering at all. Well done. Well, you, your first name's really Renata, but basically you go by Ren. And, and Ren, you, I mean, first of all, you are an amazing uh, young lady, and, and basically you've got... You, you've built a business um, all about sort of maximising human potential, which, you know, I mean, you've got two you've got two subjects here that um, are going to defeat you, aren't you? Let's face it. I mean, uh, you can't do anything f- uh, for us, really. Well, for Kevin, you probably could, but um, I'm a lost cause. So how Never do you go about late. doing – how do you do Never this, Ren? Free. How do you do it? Well, uh, so Max B started in 2019 uh, on the back of the idea that it's actually never too late. So I'll start by saying never too okay. late, Graham, at all, to okay. uh, for people to kind of lean into their highest potential self and work out who they are and, and how they can contribute. And uh, I, I sort of started Max B, uh off the back of 30 years in corporate roles. I I uh, was really lucky enough to find myself in some pretty great companies doing some awesome things and with other humans. Now, when those humans were firing on all cylinders and their most impactful self, really amazing things happened. And in, when they weren't, when they actually focused on the wrong things, weren't particularly emotionally intelligent about the way they went about things, actually things normally turned to custard. And so I truly believe that the last sort of 10 to 15 years of my working career, and thank you for the young lady comment, I will come here again. (laughs) Uh, But I probably got about 10 to 15 years in me and I just wanted to do something of really high impact. Uh, You know, I'm one of those big picture, big impact type people. And when I started to think about what I wanted to do, uh, that's what I thought about doing. I'm a technologist, so I've worked in and around technology for my whole career. So I feel very comfortable with developing tech and even new age tech as well, even though I'm a bit on the older side. And I've always been passionate about human potential. So I thought I'd bring those two things together and I want to sort of scale and democratise the development of these must-have skills. Well, I'm already confused because you've you've talked about humans and you've talked about tech. Is the, the, the solution to your solution to helping people, a blend of the two. And, and can you sort of be a bit more granular about about what it is that people... I mean, if, you, if I walk through the Max Me front door, what, what kind of things would I, I see to be able to help me? Thanks, Graham. Such a good question because, you know, the, the topic on the tip of everybody's tongue at the moment is AI, Gen AI, tech, digital yeah. age, digital skills. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it is very confusing. It's like, well, hang on a second. If we're all going to be run by the robots, what's left for the humans and what skills are we going to need? Kevin's so already a... succumbed, you know. He's he's already run by a robot. You've, in the back, <laughs> he's got like a wind up. I just sent the robot along this morning. You're not talking to Kevin at all. <laughs> the Kevin, AI did you ever robot. watch Maxwell Smart? You remember the robot Jaime? Oh, yeah. yeah. Jaime, yeah. so he used to be this, like, really very good-looking robot that used to sort of, you know, kind of go about his business, seem quite human, but at the end sometimes he malfunctioned and sort of steam started coming out of him and, like, you know, like all tech, uh, it, it runs as well as it runs until a human yeah. stuffs something up. So, Well, this, this is Kevin. You'll see by the end of the podcast he'll be he'll be completely lo- losing it, like... Uh... <laughs> But it's, we, 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 we unfortunately interrupted probably the best part of the podcast. So we'll go, we're going back. I, I, I think the clue there, though, human. Yeah. Because right. yeah. guess what? The humans aren't going anywhere. And, and actually the skills that we're going to need to be really impactful in the digital age, and there's a lot of research being done at the moment, all the big research houses are publishing the same thing. In the tech age, the skills that are going to be required are not tech skills, they're human skills, otherwise known as soft skills, but we don't like that term. No one likes that term because we all know they're not soft skills at all. They're actually hard skills. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, Deloitte's come out and said two-thirds of roles by 2030 are going to need these really high, highly developed, two-thirds, like 67% of roles are going to need highly developed soft skills or human skills, as I prefer to call them. Right. But our education pathways do not lead us in that direction at all, uh, not at school, not at uni, and not even at work. So even at work where these skills are required, unfortunately, most organisations fail to upskill their staff. They only really train and develop about 10%, either leaders or someone on a talent program. Everyone else kind of has to fend for themselves. It's like, okay, like how do I get these skills? And they hit brick walls and they disengage and they're disconnected and ultimately they're not very productive. And as I said to you, I've seen this in real life. I've worked mm-hmm. along people, alongside people who are very, very impactful, highly emotionally intelligent, really great in teams, great communicators, get stuff done, but unfortunately they're in a small percentage. Sorry. Now, your question about tech and skills, and hang on a second, but aren't we teaching humans? The reality is, Graham, Kevin, the only way we can truly scale the development of these skills is unfortunately or fortunately, depends on how you look at it because we think we've nailed the tech, yeah. is to use a technology pathway. The reason why 10% get trained today yeah. is because we have traditional training methods Often it's off the tools in a classroom for five days, drinking from a fire hose, getting sort of downloaded with all of this information, which we retain very little of, by the way, and that training actually fails to upskill us. But that is very costly. So budgets are normally really kind of sponged up through this very costly and often not very impactful type of training. Whereas actually we need to train everyone, the masses, the 90% that don't get upskilled really need this. And they're going to need it more and more and more as we move into the digital age and companies will not be tr- productive unless their people are upskilled. But the only way we can keep the price point relative and affordable yet give people a great, fun, gamified learning experience that they want to keep coming back to is through tech. That's the reality. It's unavoidable. So, it's it's our new normal. So, okay. Um You've got the ten percent probably who are getting trained, and of those, not that many of them will retain the the training that they got. And then you've got the great unwashed like us um, that basically haven't been trained, particularly. Well, I, well, I suppose I was trained at some stage back in corporate, but basically, um, there are some basic human. I don't want to call them soft skills. You've probably got a better term for it, but basically basic human skills that um, we, we all kind of will need in the next whatever 50 years of work that basically they they need where do they step on the sort of scale um almost like janet and john the first chapter if i if i'm looking at the first chapter what is it that you think you can bring to the to the world or to the you know the 90 percent or whatever it is that's going to address that first one and then the second one what is that particular problem what would you do first for them it's a great question, Graham, and I should add that we don't just use tech. We actually use a hybrid model. So we've got in, we inject human touch in there as well. It must. We must. Right. All of our clients tell us the same thing. You know, that kind of self-paced online learning, even if it's amazing digital tech, it doesn't yeah. work. It's got yeah. low completion rates because people get bored and they want to learn in groups and they want it to feel like training, yada, yada. So yeah. we've actually, we, we triangulate a few touch points and it's quite effective. But back to your question, yeah. we always start with self-awareness. Self-awareness is the absolute crux and foundation of emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And when we surveyed leaders in the workforce and we gave them six human skills to choose from, self-awareness, communication, collaboration, problem solving, etc. we said which one of these is critical to success and which one of these is missing the most. And twice more than any other, leaders told us that self-awareness is missing. Right. And self-awareness, if it's missing, everything else is sort of almost pointless because if you can't turn up as your most self-aware self and then be self-managed as well, because right? you don't just stop at that self-awareness, you need to then go, okay, well, now that I've held a mirror up to myself, I know how I tick, I know what my strengths are, I know what my derailers are, I know what my emotional go-tos are, I know what I value, all of those things, and then I can do something about it. So actually I use it to help those things that are getting in my way of impact. It's only once you've done that that the person can actually open themselves up to other skill development like communication, teamwork, empathy, you know, building trust. All of those things are critical to get the job done. This self-aware. So let's assume then that most people are not self-aware. Correct. And, and, 
I've I've seen something recently that that said that some somehow instead of jumping into a into a sort of debate sort of thing, you almost have to accept the fact that that other person has a perspective and you allow that sort of perspective to run a little bit. So that self-awareness of of the ability to to almost like block your tackle, as it were, uh, to allow the other person to flourish. Um, in my mind, that's what's coming to my mind when you're saying self-aware. The, the idea of, yes, I understand myself as potentially I might relate to other people but and and other situations. Is that what self awareness is? Is how do, I mean, I'm crikey, how do you teach self awareness? I mean, very Kevin, easily, actually. No, you can't. Really easily. Brain. Oh, no, te- teach easily. Kevin then. Teach, yeah, teach well, Kevin. I'm all ears. Ke- yeah. Kevin just needs to, we, we've got it. We've got it built into our flow. It's a self discovery. We use a, a framework called the VIA framework. It's basically gives the person a frame, uh, the framework gives the person their character strengths, one through yeah. 24. Um, there's many other assessment frameworks. We prefer this one because, one, it's linked very deeply to this concept of positive psychology, and a lot of research has been done to say that when a person is in a positive, positively psychologically sort of safe environment and mindset, yeah. they just open themselves up to the very things that you just mentioned, Graham, which is yeah. other people's perspective. So yeah, back to self-awareness. Self-awareness and self-management, one side of the emotional intelligence, uh, you know, kind of... Um, algorithm that sits in the world of me myself looking inward because when I look inward and I get that right I then can go into the world of we where I exist with other people and I can be more socially aware and also manage myself better in social situations which is all around working with other people collaboration collaborative problem solving these are unavoidable in the digital age by the way the complex things that humans are going to have to solve in that age cannot be done alone so actually you're going to need to be able to innovate with other people you're going to be able to tap into other people's perspectives exactly what you said before graham pause my ideas and listen to somebody else's ask great questions become a better listener rather than having to put my point across and always be right and act with ego how do i take a step back because actually i'm i'm aware enough to know that i can do that yeah. And I know how to do that. And then I can listen to other people's perspectives. And guess what? I might learn something I didn't know before. Absolutely. It's a really great point. I mean, and the, I mean, your knowledge, uh, Ren, is just awesome. I mean, it, you said that you had quite a number of years in corporate, but, you know, that 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 shouldn't be on your wall there. I mean, that, that should be like a demerit, shouldn't it? Because, I mean, if we're working in corporate, it's, they're big, dumb companies, aren't they? I mean, at the end of the day, there might be some um, some great people amongst them, but... It's difficult to learn in that environment, I think. But maybe you did. I mean, maybe I'm being cynical there. No, look, Graham, I've always had the pursuit of understanding. I I guess, I don't know, genetically, maybe I was born that way and I've always been brought up that way to really seek to understand. And my mum always taught me to be very humble about what I know and who I am and to always seek learning from around me because that way I would get much further in life. So I guess I was always just groomed that way from the way I was brought up and I've always been really interested in why people do the things that they do. And interestingly, my oldest daughter is studying psychology and her real passion is understanding human behaviour. So I guess the apple doesn't fall far from don't, the apple don't, don't Don't get her to watch this because she'll, she'll be... she'll be, she'll be you, you remember the Faulty <laughs> Towers episode where the psychologist came to stay? It'd be like that, really. <laughs> She'd be taking notes and putting me up oh on the blackboard, God. won't she? I reference but, Faulty Towers and, in fact, that episode many oh, times. Oh, <laughs> so I can't believe you just brought it up. Yeah, I just, anyway. well, it's, it's a fantastic oh, it's a fantastic series. In fact, somewhere. No, I love Faulty Towers. I've got the oh script God. somewhere in, in a couple of And let me books. tell you, I've just come back from an, a, a month in India and some of the uh, – some of the hotel experiences I had made <laughs> me think of that show. But anyway, mm-hmm. uh, so so look, at the end of the day, it's so important to put yourself through the very things that you're trying to then inculcate others with. So I always say to people, the maximum products and programs 
combine research, science, and the lived experience. So many things that we encounter in our lives are theory-based and, are, you know, look great in a research paper, look fantastic from all the data points. But at the end of the day, if you only look at that aspect and you don't overlay, what really happens in real life to real humans? You actually fall short of being able to actually drive sustainable change. So I've been able to bring all of those things together. I've done a lot of personal development. I'm a trained coach. It's always been important to me to sort of look at things through different lenses to, I guess, what typical people around me in in my corporate roles, my peers may have done. And look, I'm not judging. It's not a place of judgment. It just, I was quite different. And sometimes it did feel I was that salmon swimming against the stream. But I guess that's why I left and started MaxMe. So, Ren, just wind back a minute. We talked about needing to get this to the 90%, not the 10%. That's a lot of people. So we yeah. said tech has to be the way to do that. But then we said, hang on a minute, self-paced learning online doesn't work. But that's one of the reasons you would use tech is because you can do something once and then distribute it to a whole lot of people. So how do we get past that barrier? How do we actually deliver this? It's a really good question, Kevin, and I'll be really honest. It's taken us three years to get this recipe right uh, in MaxMe. We've done a lot of market testing. We've worked the product over and over. We have had some fantastic clients who really want to get this right with their people. So we've been able to iterate it and get that, you know, as they say, product market fit right. And what we found is it's got to have a number of magical touch points. The tech has got to be there. It's got to be gamified. So I always describe us as the Duolingo of soft skill development or human skill development. We know that Duolingo is the gold standard around self-paced app learning for language language acquisition. And, you know, we always sort of wanted our experience to be short and sharp and it needed to be gamified and keep it sticky, but it's not enough. And so what we wrap around it is some human touch. We know we need to bring people together in these kind of group coaching Uh, moments where people can share things with one another, can learn together. It sort of feels like we're doing it. It still feels like training, I guess, right? We are programmed, like it or not, to want to sort of go through that sort of special touch training, but it's got to be light touch because it's got to be right for busy people and it's got to have multiple touch points. It's got to have those moments. We we inject leaderboards. We inject like, you know, sort of push notifications. So we want the participants to feel surrounded by the learning experience, but we don't want it to feel heavy. We still want it to feel like it's their learning experience, but that they're doing it with others. And so we bring the fun back into learning. You call the app Hody or Hody or? Correct, Hody. Perfect. I love the way you pronounced it, Greg. What what does it stand for? Is it it, actually, yeah, sorry. uh, Is it just a made up name? (laughs) <laughs> well, it is, but it's actually a Latin word. And when I started to think about what what the app needed to, I guess, signify, the thing that we really wanted to bring to market was this concept of every day is a day to lean into learning about yourself and about others. And, you know, that striving to kind of continue to bring your best version every day. And Hody means today in Latin. So we chose it because of the meaning, but also the word Hody, I don't know, to us as a team, it sort of gave us this fun character vibe. I can't explain it. Like, you know, if you look at the the symbol for the app, it's like a smiley orange face and Hody for us is this little orange creature and you'll see it through the app experience. Hody's almost like the concierge of the MaxMe app. And Hody's always there. It's like, you know, my pal that's there through my learning journey, reminding me about things and sprinkling a couple of, you know, cute little sort of learning moments this, throughout the experience. This is so spooky because I bought a hoodie. Oh, no, no, a hoodie. It's my first ever hoodie. I've never had a hoodie. In my, I always thought drug dealers wore them. But basically, <laughs> um, I bought the first hoodie because – we're going to a, a, a place uh, next weekend and, and it, it's, it should be sunny, but it's, yeah. And I was thinking ah, that might just co- go down really well. Um, and um, so that was a, f- so, but it's that, but that will be with an extra O. Oh, so you, yours, Correct. so if somebody's listening to this, then it's H O D I E. So hoodie and, um, oh, hoodie, sorry. Um, and, um, you know, 
you open it up and then it has all these it's almost you said it's gamified so you you can actually and will it start with self-awareness is that the thing that it you does would, that's actually the only critical component there is no mandatory pathways even though they're heavily curated but whatever pathway right. you choose to learn down we've brought the research science and lived experience to that sort of give you that confidence and that competence quickly but yeah. The only mandatory part of our whole learning experience is the first level, which is the self-awareness level we talk about because we want to actually educate people around this concept of strengths and weaknesses. Most people don't know what their strengths are. In fact, research, Gallup has done a lot of research around this and they have found that only 1% of people know what their strengths are and use them every day. And it's just because we're not conditioned. Traditionally, if you, if the three of us think about what is the pathway that we were conditioned for, it's yeah. trying to make weaknesses into strengths. Doesn't yeah. matter what year in school. I'm, I'm the child of a European father. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many A's I used to bring home on my report card. His eye would always be drawn to the C's, to the D's. And if I, God forbid, brought one home, there would be a half an hour talking to around what am I going to do to make the C into an A. He didn't talk about the A's and there were A's, let me tell you, but he wasn't interested in that. He just wanted to tell me what I needed to do to make those C's into A's and we are conditioned to that. We're conditioned to spend and waste our time trying to make our weaknesses into strengths rather than knowing what our strengths are and continuing the pursuit of excellence through that lens. So now, have I'm you... Not is is Please. is it, have you built some of your dad's thinking into the into hoodie or, or or actually have you kind of said well actually that's a that was a generational thing a lot of fathers probably i would say up to a point myself as well that you you would want to sort of see your children do better than yourself and therefore there was that push to sort of in the, I suppose, in their own way, get beyond where you got to. Um, now, the, the, I don't know. Um, so was your dad right or wrong? I think my dad was, you know, right in his own way in terms of that's the way he chose to live his life. But the positive psychology movement, as I mentioned before, headed up by an amazing man called Martin Seligman, yeah. talks about the importance of that positivity in our mind and always looking at ourselves through that kind of growth lens through the positive lens. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying disregard what you're not good at, but what I'm saying is know about it, be self-aware about it, and mm. then work how you work around those derailers. Don't try and make them into strengths because that's a waste of time. And research has found that I think it's something like 10,000 person hours to make something that you're not good at into something that you're probably at best going to be mediocre to okay in. Yeah. What would happen if you spent that same amount of time making what you're good at into something you are excellent at? Excellent, exceptional. And the minute you start to talk about this with people and you get them beyond this, I don't understand what you're talking about or they reject what you're talking about, the minute you get them there, it's like these light globes go off for them. It's these epiphanies and this permission to go, actually, I don't need to continue to feel crap about myself and continue to feed my negativity bias because actually we're wired for survival, but that's not getting me anywhere. Yeah. What would it look like for me to actually embrace my greatness and continue to do more of that? Not in an egotistical douchebag kind of way, but in a no. really humble, confident, let's get on with this kind of way. I, I I really like that approach. I do. I, I have to say that I'll never be good at certain things. And I, I, and to be honest with you, I don't have any interest in being good at certain certain of my weaknesses. Um, but having said that, um, I, I genuinely would like to get better at some of the things I do care about. So so I think there's there's a there's a streak certainly within myself. What about you, Kevin? I mean, are, are you are you bothered about your weaknesses? No, nope, not at all. Not at all. And I'm thinking back to school reports and a penny has just dropped there the time that was spent you got to see in a particular subject so what are you going to do about it well actually you're just at the very start of finding out what you're good at and what you're not good at i remember that at school languages certainly was not my thing well we were back in the days that you still taught was still still taught latin at school oh, French, and if right, it was possible to be uh, 26th in a class of 25 at latin that was me <laughs> But of course, the Latin teacher thought that his subject was the most important. So if you were down in the bottom three or four, you were brought in for extra lessons and all sorts of things. And really, 
I remember the phrase, Latin as a language, as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans and now it's killing me. <laughs> exactly. But 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 there are some amongst us that are, would have been A++ in Latin because that's their streak. And yeah. yay for them, and they've probably gone off to do amazing thing with this pursuit of wherever that Latin took them. But the reality is this, and I, I'll, I'll say to you, my top five strengths are leadership, hope, fairness, zest. They're, they're the things that I've always been good at. They're the things that I turn up with and they're the things that motivate me and others. What I'm not so good at is perseverance. Now, interestingly, how could you be not good at perseverance but have developed and delivered massive, multi, hundreds of million dollars worth of business transformation projects? You're going to say to me, well, that's impossible, Renata. How could you project manage or portfolio manage something with having low perseverance? Well, guess what I do? I put people with high perseverance in my teams, those people that love to finish things because I'm a starter. I'm not a finisher. It drains my living energy to have to take something to the nth degree and finish it with the I's and the T's crossed, but other people love doing that. So I go and find those people and then we have group strength. That is the essence of collaboration and innovation in groups, finding people who have complementary strengths to yours, knowing what each other's derailers are and then getting on with it and not letting it get in the way, but knowing it and embracing it and being really overt about it right from the beginning. That's, that's a brilliant way of looking at life. I have to say that I completely uh, concur with your view that, that you know, you, you have to surround yourself. Pro probably the best co corporate relationships I had were, were with broad opposites, not quite, but somebody you could sync with, but somebody who had skills that you just didn't have. And and you would seek them out, <laughs> excuse me, when and when you were building a team. And to completely understand that, and the best teams come from that arrangement. Is it is it likely that Hody itself will, will generate the collaborations because you understand the, 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 the sort of the way in which you're all potentially capable of meshing? Well, it certainly changed the conversation and the mindset. You know, I work with a lot of co companies and you ask people, when you first come into a new team, what do you do? And they'll all have a bit of a sneaker and say, oh, you know, we'll have a, like an a icebreaker you know, we'll share each other's names and, you know, we might sort of say, oh, what's one fun fact about you that no one knows? Okay, amazing, great, fantastic. That's the first hour killed. And then what do you do? We, we get straight to work, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, well, here's the task and here's the thing and, okay, who's doing what? And, we, you know, we sort of start to divide the work and then on we go. Not mm -hmm. once have we had a conversation to say, who is Ren? Who yeah. is Kevin? Who is yeah. Graham? What do they bring yeah. to this team? What do they love doing? What do they not love doing? And so we run teams through exercises. Yeah. We actually start to look at their collective strengths, their collective lower strengths. Who mm. are they and how can they start to leverage and learn from one another? And when you start in that way, and, you know, Patrick Lencioni, who I am such a zealot for, he's written this amazing book called Five Dysfunctions of Team. And in there, of course, he tries and, you know, he tries to educate on the critical success factors behind high-performing high teams, but he does it, of course, in a sort of, in the kind of opposite way to make the point. But the absolute pillar of any high-performing team is building trust and rapport. When we're having that icebreaker and then we're moving straight to work, guess what we haven't done? We haven't built trust and rapport with one another. And if we haven't done that, then we can't engage in healthy conflict, which is where innovation happens because we don't know who we are. We're not going to do that unless it's psychologically safe to engage in that debate and that brainstorming. And if we don't do that, then we don't feel committed to what we're doing or accountable to what we're trying to achieve. And guess what doesn't happen? Results. So that high-performing team norm is so critical for us to keep in our minds as we play in teams or when we lead teams. Like how do you build that? And the absolute foundation is to help people unlock who they are, self-aware, yeah. self-managed, and then move and work with others in that way. Ren, you've absolutely knocked it out of the park. I mean, you, you people are, are going to be listening to this and thinking, wow, um, you know, how do I get in touch with them? Um, with Max me and if I'm based in the UK can I actually get your services 
Our app is, well, so certainly the app is available in the App Store and Google Play, so it's download and use. But, yes, definitely. Yeah. At the moment, we're sort of an Australian-based business, but we work with international companies. So what we don't have in the UK yet is a physical presence. Some of our clients like us to work with their people face-to-face, so we occasionally run uh, face-to-face workshops. But for our multinational clients who have presence in the UK and other way in other places, we yeah. run virtual uh, programs. It's still a human touch. We still have all the gamified touch points. It's just that we don't have a physical presence in the UK if you want us to come and run face-to-face workshops. But we will be, be coming to the UK, but not yet. It must be. I mean, the timing with this is it's it's quite late on for you, and 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 for us, it's first thing in the morning. So basically, getting that sort of face to face, particularly from Australia, you you really would need somebody who was local, wouldn't you? I, I think so. But as I said to you, we run multinational. Uh, so we've got clients that have got people in Asia, yeah. in the US and the UK. So you can see how it would be tricky, but we f- we find our way around it. And sometimes we run two groups. So when we can't get everybody on a similar time, you know, kind of starting, then we'll run two groups um, virtually, but we make it work for clients. Like I said to you, they have multinational footprints and what they love about the programs that we run is, of course, it creates a sense of community and connection with their people that are actually working around the world. So it brings them together and it makes them feel like part of one team, one company, and then, of course, they're developing these fabulous skills that they need for their impact and their engagement. So is it purely in English or have you have you developed it in different languages? It's English only for the English moment. Uh, yeah. we, we sort of have our hands full just with getting to, you know, just English-speaking uh, people yeah. around the world. And we're certainly not, we don't want to um, be exclusive, but it's just the way that uh, it's turned out. And yeah. uh, so we go w- with our English-speaking. Don't get me wrong, we've got multi-languages on the on the roadmap, but for yeah. where we are right now, probably for the next year or so, there will well, be. We English. seem to have a few listeners who for, for where English is, is their second language. I mean, particularly those people in America. So at the, at the end of the day, they, they <laughs> tend to... Uh, have their own version of English, which they like to tune into this because Indeed. We, speak, Indeed. we speak proper English here. Indeed, so, you uh, do. But um, so, but you, you we, we I, have run programs with people with English as a second language. So, okay. uh, mm. what what we do, the, the actually, I must really um, say that what we've chosen to put out on the app is simple language, yeah. single sentence with visuals to, to sort of really reinforce because some of the concepts, even though they're human, are yeah. actually quite difficult to grasp. So we've tried to put out a very accessible learning pathway out into the market and then our facilitators are trained. They're all fully trained facilitators and know how to train in a very accessible way as well. So we know that we have to cater to different learning speeds and all sorts of things, just like in any classroom I guess let's put it that way so we are very much trained to you know to, to be able to meet at least most people that we touch where they are and looking out five ten years um where will max me end up well, I mean, our, our vision is very much to get to as many people as we can globally in their pursuit of these skills. You know, ultimately what we really want to do is to change culture and the very workplaces that all of us have worked in. And we know the positives and maybe not so positives, particularly around culture. We want to, in, in a small however big, humble, whatever way we can, we want to change workplace cultures and create the work environments where people can flourish and be the best version of themselves and want to come to work and love their career and all sorts of things. And, of course, the other thing that personally I'm very passionate about is how do you get rid of the need to run diversity, equity and inclusion programs, which we know do not work. They don't work. These bias programs or like whatever, we know that they're not shifting the needle because we know that if every person comes to work and can be empathetic and respectful to other people and open to other people's perspectives and self-aware and manage themselves well and be highly emotionally intelligent, you wouldn't we need know that. we're going to have more diverse, equitable <laughs> and inclusive environments. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I've got to say that um, I'm not a great believer in that at all because I think it's a diversion um, but um, but I agree with you. you we, if you worked on skills and the way in which we work with each other, um, then, uh, you know, those sort of things wouldn't be required at all. But, you know, I'm sure if somebody has a, an alternative point of view, then you're free to write into our our um, uh, special um, uh, box for your type of comment, which is 
you know, next hundred days dot org forward slash we don't give a damn. So um but um but no seriously that's not, that's not true. <laughs> Kevin Renata, we've talked about diversity, we've talked about language, we've talked about global reach, but I can see a whole page on your website that's about Max Me India. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. The majestic India. Look, I um hmm. I have a very special spot in my heart for India, and that's because I've worked with many different uh, companies that uh, happen to be headquartered in India throughout my technology career, as you can imagine. Uh, I had onshore teams, I had offshore teams, I visited India. In fact, I, I say to people, I've actually visited India more than any other country in the world, and my husband's Italian, so that's saying a lot. And the reality is this, that I have worked with some incredibly capable people that have an Indian cultural background and they get a really bad rap. And we know that they are going to skill the rest of the world. I mean, the next decade is definitely going to be India's. They are very highly educated. Mm. They have great skills, but they don't have these human skills, just like the rest of the world. Yeah. And so what my real passion is, is to change the game again in a humble way in India. I've been over there. We've set up our business. I really want to help that country and its people yeah. to be the best version of themselves because I've seen what happens. Yeah. As I said to you, I've had many teams, hundreds of people, including Indian nationals, graduates all the way through to highly skilled people. And I've seen what happens when you can turn people on. And I want to really ignite possibility in India. And it's that is the reason why I've gone to India next after Australia. It's the place, as I said to you, it, it, we, we've launched there. I'm passionate about uh, what's happening there. It's a lot. I, I mean, honestly, you come away from there and it's electric there. It, things, you know, move so quickly. It's so vibrant. They're so hungry to progress and to get you know, to move forward. It's a real pleasure to talk to people and work with people over there. It's the way that I like to move and, their yeah, culture, I'm excited. Their culture is is a sort of um, this, uh, this vibrant uh, growth, et cetera. Everything's going on at, at, at once. What it, you talk, there's this thing in my mind about what you mentioned about culture, and I'm trying to work out if Hody and your Max me are, are about changing the culture. I think that's what you said earlier. Then how would you define culture? Well, I mean, you know, certainly in all of the uh, self-development I've done, culture has always be, been defined as the way we do things around here. It, it's the norm that we become acclimatised mm. to when we come to a new situation. So Culture is normally, it, it's, you know, you can say it's written or, you know, I once participated in a culture program. Like there's no such thing. Yeah. Culture is the thing that we notice other people doing and it becomes our norm. And humans have a need to fit in, right? We're pack animals. Yeah. So the last thing we want to do is to stand out. Now there's some of us that don't give a crap, Elon Musk, let's go with him first. You know, we just go on and we do things the way we do things. But most of us are conditioned to want to fit in. And we want to fit into the new circumstances that we find ourselves in. Let's call it loosely culture, the way things do, are done. And so we gravitate towards that and we teach ourselves new norms so that we can fit in. And that quickly becomes our culture or our pattern of behaviour and the way we show up. And I would like for us, Max, me, in, in, in some way, hopefully in a major way, to define positive cultures where people feel safe to be the best version of themselves, not any version of themselves. And I say this to people all the time. We are yeah. not giving people permission to turn up as an asshole and say, yeah. that's just who I am, accept me for who I am. No, we want people to understand that they do have to be aware of themselves and others. They do have to be empathetic. They've got to be mindful. They've got to be accepting of other people's ways of doing things, not my way or the highway. And so we want to create those cultural norms so when the new people join that they see that that's the way it's okay to be and they feel that psychological safety to lean in and just do that, to be the best version of themselves and they don't have to fight to be something else just to fit in. Great answer. Kevin? Great answer. Again, lost for words, Graham. Well, I think there's, there's definitely something in this and culture thing is really interesting and i i recorded a podcast a few weeks ago on, on business strategy where we talked about culture of the organization being a key thing we kind of thought about it as a an empty bottle the bottle has got a certain shape 
and the shape of the bottle is different in every organization. Mm. Kind of whatever you're doing in the organization, you're putting into that bottle and it ends up being bottle shaped, whatever the bottle is. You know? That culture That's is a such analogy. a powerful thing. Whatever it is you're doing in the organization, whatever change you're putting together, whatever new initiative it is, it suddenly takes a a shape that's ingrained in the organization. And I, I, I think it's fascinating to work out whether it's possible to change that shape or how easy it's, it is to change the shape. I'd like to believe that we're dealing with plastic bottles, not, not you know, glass bottles, right? Because glass bottles are much harder to, to sort of shape and, and they're not as pliable. But I do believe, I love that analogy, and, it, and what is the opportunity to kind of redefine or you know, sort of put out a little bubble out here so that we can fit something else in that corner that we didn't quite think would fit in. I think that's so important, but to be open to that, not to freak out when the bottle starts to change shape because the other thing that I know to be true from 30 years of running business transformation is people don't fear change. Actually, we are we are revolutionary beings. Like we are, uh, we're built to evolve and therefore to change. We have to, to survive. What we fear is loss. We fear the unknown because as humans we are scared of what we're going to lose. And the minute we think we're going to lose, we go into complete defence mode because we want to defend what we have so that we don't lose anything. We don't lose our position. We don't lose our, you know, our, our standing. We don't lose what whatever it is for you. And so the minute that we see change around us and we don't understand it or it's unknown or we don't know what it feels like to lean in and we don't understand it that's when we start to take defensive positions and we start to freak out so how do we create those cultures where we know because you know you hear lots of companies saying oh we're a learning culture here and we fail fast and we're on this pursuit of innovation what a load of bullshit because the thing that happens the first thing that happens is the minute that someone fails or there's some sort of loss to the balance sheet, everyone starts freaking out. And mm. then, of course, the cultural role modelling is, no, no, don't ever speak up. No, no, don't ever make a mistake because you're going to lose the company money. But what would it take to fro you know, leapfrog another company? Sometimes you've got to lose money to make money mm. as long as it's risk. You know, you take a risk-based approach as long as it's a mindful approach. You have to fail fast to learn, particularly in complex situations. We could have a, a, a full mini series with you, Ren. I mean, you you are just chock full of brilliant ideas, and I'd I'd love to be able to spend more time um, <laughs> uh, mining that mine of yours. But it, you, you'll be ready for bed. I'm surprised you're not in your pajamas. It's it's quite My late goodness, in Australia. I'm feeling lightheaded. No, no, no. Are it's you... been so amazing. You guys are just incredible. <laughs> but well, I I want to th uh, thank you for joining us today on the next 100 Days podcast. So, Graham, are you off to download Hody onto your phone? <laughs> um, I'm sort of tempted. I'm surprised you haven't done it already, Kevin, because uh, you you kind of you, you can multitask. Um, but um, I, there's the the like what I liked about it, Kevin, is is the focus on self awareness, and you know if you are if you are more self aware, then the other things kind of fall into place a little bit easier I, I guess and that would be the logic um and um so yeah i'm very impressed with with ren and what she she's bringing to the world so, and i completely understand why she's going after india i mean what is that a billion people and my experience of them is they're super intelligent people uh, really want to help you have a great work ethic but yet sometimes they mess up but that's inevitable and and yes they don't basically necessarily um know quite how to react with, with with other people but having said that with ren's help i think uh it'll supercharge them mm, yeah yeah so a very very interesting episode graham I, I think it's interesting it loops back to remember the second podcast we ever did we talked about strength finder oh right yes yeah, yeah. and I, I, I guess that's where ren's starting from looking at you know, what are you good at what are you bad at not not strengths and weaknesses in terms of all those subjects you used to do at school but strengths and weaknesses in terms of you know, leadership learning it 
If you remember back to some of the probably worst um, appraisals you ever had, you probably will recall that you magnified the one or two things that you could do better on and all the things that you did really well were kind of almost like brought in with the milk it was it, it was just um it seems to me that ren's figuring out a way to overcome that yeah. um by by saying look actually if you motor on marketing you might become one of the best marketers you you know you're you got the cap capability of becoming a real impact in that field you know marketing finance whatever but it, you know for me um the logic is you know if you're if you're really good at golf then uh, but you're rubbish at, i don't know um drawing then you know forget the drawing <laughs> you know put your energy into golf I mean, it just seems to me that uh, she's onto something and it's not rocket science, but it it needs to be thought through in a corporate context. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think getting out of that culture that says, this is what you're no good at, go develop it. Here's all your development for the next 12 months centered around getting better at those things we've identified as your weaknesses. Mm. be something that disappears from corporate culture completely well you know you can find out more about uh ren and uh max me the the website is max me that's m-a-x-m-e dot com dot a-u for australia um, and if you go to their uh, website there you'll find loads more about how uh, Ren's company can actually help you. So it's been another uh, great uh, uh, podcast, Kevin. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, Ren coming onto the onto the scene. And actually, the next podcast, believe it or not, is with another Ren. But you'll have to wait for that. So anyway, I will say goodbye to uh, today. I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>